Okay, thank you to the organizers. It's a big pleasure for me to be here at this conference for my colleagues, Alice and Paul. Um, so I'd like to talk about minimal services. So I, I already talked a bit about the subject during uh, the mini course. So minimal services are among the most uh, well-studied objects in differential geometry, but it's and, and there are many examples for some specific spaces, but uh, the, gen the general existence theory of these objects uh, is still uh, rather uh, mysterious. The expectation is that there should be lots of them, and we have been able to confirm that for the case of generic metrics in some uh, unpredicted uh, uh, way. So let me start with the motivating conjecture in the field. This is the conjecture of Yao. So the conjecture says that every uh, closed Riemannian manifold, say three manifold, M3G, uh, contains infinitely many this is the keyword here. Uh, smooth closed immersed minimal sources so this is the uh, the original conjecture of Yao this is the first problem in the minimal surfaces section in his list of, of problems so maybe five or six years ago I started thinking about uh, this problem with my collaborator, Andre Nevis, uh, and uh, our efforts for the past few years culminated now with the following result that we just posted a few months ago. So this is a theorem joined with Erie 2017. So the theorem says that let M n plus 1 be a closed manifold. And let's suppose the dimension is between 3 and 7 for the regularity reasons. Then uh, for a C infinity generic metric, C infinity generic metric. G on M, so sometimes we say for almost all metrics in the bare sense. So for a typical metric on the manifold, not only there are infinitely many minimal surfaces, but actually there are infinitely many minimal surfaces intersecting every uh, single ball uh, in the manifold. Okay, so the right way of saying this is that if I take the union of all closed, smooth, embedded, and notice here that I get embedded hypersurfaces instead of immersed. Uh, the union of all closed, smooth, embedded, minimal hypersurfaces. Minimal hypersurfaces in, uh, in M is dense. So this is the uh, denseness result. So of course this implies Yao's conjecture for generic metrics. But as I said, implies a much stronger property. So just draw a picture here for if you, this is the manifold M, no matter how small the region you have, for a generic metric there will be a 
infinitely many minimal surfaces that intersect that open set, uh, that open set use. So, so previously, very little, I mean, was known. So there was a result by Lawson for the, partic for the particular case of the round metric in S3. So he showed that it, for that case, there are closed minimal surfaces of every genus. But for general metrics, the best result until very recently was this result of Pitts, 1981. He proved that there exists at least one uh, minimal hypersurface. So from now on, whenever I say minimal hypersurface, I mean a smooth embedded uh, closed minimal hypersurface. So he did that by using the minimax method. And a few years ago, joint, jointly with, with Nevis, we proved that this was posted in 2013. We, proved, we improved this, this, this number here to n plus 1. So there are at least uh, n plus 1 minimal hypersurfaces. And in the case of Ritchie positive, we actually can, can construct infinitely many. And infinitely many. which you cover is positive. So for, for general metrics, n plus 1 is still the best result. Okay, there are at least n plus 1 minimum hypersurfaces. Conjecturally, there should be infinitely many. Okay, so this was more, more or less the history. I should say that we expect that this result should be true in higher dimensions as long as one allows minimum hypersurfaces with singular sets. And the, and the theory says that these singular sets will be relatively small, so they will have co-dimension 7. Uh, but there are some parts in the proof that still do not extend to that situation. <coughs> Here, actually, one can, one can do in any dimension by allowing uh, such singular sets. So <coughs> I guess maybe a month or so after we posted this, we've been able to uh, prove another result, which is somehow more precise or more powerful than, than this. This is the equidistribution theorem. Jointly with Nevis and Antoine Song, who is here in the audience. So we proved that, again, under the same assumptions. So again, you let m n plus 1 be a closed manifold. with those dimensions, then for a C infinity generic metric on M, G on M, there exists a sequence, say sigma i, of, uh, here I will add the uh, connectedness. Uh, property so that of let me say again the smooth the usual thing closed embedded connected minimal hypersurface such that that it, that is equidistributed in the manifold that is equidistributed and this is the key word here m and the equidistribution property means that if you give me any continuous function f on the manifold, if I, if I integrate my function f over the first q minimal hypersurfaces, and if I, if I divide by the total volume, so if I take the sum i going from 1 to q of the integral over sigma i of f, and if I divide that by the total volume, the sum of the volumes of the sigma i's. The limit as q goes to infinity recovers the average of the function on the whole manifold. 
Okay, so if I take the average of f over the first q minimal hypersurfaces, that average converges to the global average of m. And of course, this implies denseness, right? Because a sequence that omits an open set cannot be equidistributed. So this is stronger than, uh, than denseness. Uh, in the paper, we actually prove some, somehow a stronger equidistribution property with respect to tensors, but for the purposes of this talk, let me just state this. Okay, of course, this equivalently, this is saying that if I sum the measures associated to these hypersurfaces, so the measure of sigma i of an open set is just the volume of the surface inside that open set. So the, and if I normalize this so that it's a probability measure, so I divide by the sum of the total volumes, this converges to the Lebesgue measure of the manifold normalized. volume measure. Okay, so, so my goal today is going to explain the proof. Let me say that the main, the main tool in the proof of this result is the vial law for the volume spectrum. which I proved in the mini course. Okay, so I'm, we also use the theory of Brian White for bumpy metrics. I'm going to explain that in a second. Let me first describe the vial law. Okay, like that, so what is this? Mu is like the Lebesgue uh, volume measure of the metric G. So it's like the standard Riemannian measure. M is the manifold. Yeah, M is the manifold. Okay, so. So let me uh, describe the, the, the vial law. So, so the idea is that in, you know, in, in Morse theory, you like to, um, the idea is that you like to construct critical points by first understanding the topology of the underlying space. So if I take, for instance, uh, so the idea is that I'd like to consider the space of unoriented uh, closed hypersurfaces uh, sigma of dimension n that are boundaries of something, of a region u. So this is my space of cycles. Technically, as you, you, as you have seen in the course, this is a space of modulo 2 uh, flat cycles that are boundaries. So, so the point is that this space has the topology of an RP infinity. So this is weak homotopy, as I explained in the course. And in order to, to prove this, one needs to consider here the flat topology, which is topology that given two hypersurfaces, two closed hypersurfaces, they are close to each other if they bound a region of very uh, small volume. So we are using here the flat topology. So in particular, here inside RP infinity, I have RPKs for every K. So this is saying that I have non-trivial uh, K parameter sweepouts of surfaces for, for every K. So once one has a natural class of sweepouts, one can do minimax. So you first maximize the area over a given sweepout, and then you minimize that over all sweepouts. And that gives you a number that is supposed to be the area of a minimal hypersurface. So the volume spectrum here is going to be a sequence of numbers non-decreasing sequence of numbers okay. 
So omega k is called the k width and is a minimax value. Minimax value over k parameter sweep outs. So in order to define it precisely, one needs to consider the, the curve product, but I won't do here. I did it in the course. So this is the idea. Somehow this might reminds, remind us of the standard spectrum of the Laplacian, where the eigenvalues also have a minimax characterization. So the point, what we need to know about these numbers, well, first, that they are actually the area of a minimal hypersurface. So the property that we need is that uh, for each k, I can find uh, a disjoint collection, say sigma 1, sigma q, of minimal hypersurfaces, and also some integers Positive, positive integers such that uh, omega k of mg is actually the sum of the the sum of the volumes with with multiplicity. So the sum of m i volume g of sigma. I. Okay, so each omega k is really the area of a minimal surface. In order to prove this, one needs, of course, the almgren pitts Mimax theory. But almgren pitts Mimax theories for homotopy classes, this is a bit more general, so one has to combine this with the most index estimates that I proved with Andre in 2015. And also, we need uh, a compactness theorem of sharp. So sharp proved that if you look at a, a set of minimal surfaces which that have both the volume and the index bounded from above, that that space is compact. Okay, so that's what uh, sharp proved. So the other thing we need to know about the k-width is that it actually depends continuously on the metric. So even more omega k of mg is a Lipschitz function of the metric. This is not very difficult uh, to prove. So Gromov He conjectured that, so he, he wrote first paper in 1988 where he he's already talking about uh, vial laws in connection with, with the problem, but the, the conjecture explicitly appeared in 2013 was that the uh, volume spectrum obeys a vial law. just like the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Just like the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So this was, was the conjecture, motivated by some analogies between this variation problem and the variation problem associated to the Rayleigh function that gives you the eigenvalues. And this conjecture we proved so the statement is the following. So the statement is it's a theorem of was proven with the Okumovich, the postdoc at MIT, and Andre Nevis jointly in 2016. So we prove that there exists a dimensional constant A of n, positive, a universal constant, so that 
if I take the limit as k goes to infinity of omega k, the k width divided by k to this sublinear power 1 over n plus 1, then this, this sequence of numbers converges to a dimensional constant times the volume of m with the appropriate power. Okay, so this is the this is the vial law that we that we proved. So I should say that before this result, uh, there were results by Gromov and also Guth. So this is also kind of inspired by work of Guth. So what they proved was that these numbers for for a fixed m, uh, the sequence of numbers is is bounded by by constants that might depend uh, on the manifold m. Okay, so actually they're not only bounded; they actually converge. Uh, to this number. Okay, so let me check my time here. This is good. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to uh, explain to you the proof of the denseness result. So how does this imply the denseness result? Okay, so, so the truth is that a after we have all this theory, actually the, the proof of the denseness result is not so difficult. So I'd like to explain here. Echo distribution is a bit more involved. The denseness should be possible to explain here in the remaining minutes that I have. Raise this too. So So we also use the theory of Brian White of bumpy metrics. Bumpy metrics. So a metric is bumpy if every minimal hypersurface, meaning the closed minimal hypersurface, here we can put immersed is non-degenerate. Okay, so non-degenerate means that the Jacobi operator has no zero eigenvalues, or equivalently, your minimal, sur your minimal surface as a critical point of the area functional has a uh, uh, non-degenerate second variation uh, quadratic form. So the useful thing about these surfaces is that one can apply uh, the implicit function theorem, and if you perturb the metric, the surface gets perturbed also. Okay, so I should say that in, the, in our paper with Erie, this is actually proposition one in the paper, which uh, actually follows from some stuff that we did earlier with Andre. So here's proposition number two. So if you give me a hypersurface sigma in some manifold M, and if, if this is a minimal hypersurface, uh, say embedded, well, it's, it's implicit that it's embedded, mm -hmm. then one can perturb arbitrarily, you know, we can find an arbitrarily small perturbation of the metric so that it, this remains minimal but becomes non degenerate. Okay, so there's going to be a sequence of metrics which converge to G in this infinity. Uh, topology such that sigma is minimal, still minimal, but now it's also non-degenerate in M G I for every I. Okay, so this is simple to prove. I mean, the idea is that if one has a minimal hypersurface, then one can consider variations by a normal uh, vector field, and then the second variation is associated to the Jacobi operator, which is the operator that takes a normal, normal section and returns the normal Laplacian plus A squared plus Ricci. X, where A is the second fundamental form, N is the unit normal, some unit normal, so this is Jacobi operator, 
And then the, the idea of the proof is that if I take my metric gi, I can just do it by a conformal deformation. So I can take uh, the metric e2 divided by i, a function phi times g, where the function, the smooth function phi, is so that phi is equal to the distance squared to sigma in some neighborhood of sigma. So this is a very explicit affirmation. And then what one can check that sigma remains minimal with respect to gi. And one can also check that the Jacobi operator actually gets shifted. So the Jacobi operator of, of sigma as a submanifold of mgi applied to x is just the original one, L sigma applied to x. And then there's a minus 2n divided by i times x. So I can see that if 0 is an eigenvalue of this operator, then it's because 2n divided by i is an eigenvalue of the original guy. But of course, the spectrum is locally finite, so that, that cannot be true. Okay, so, so for sufficiently large i, 0 cannot be an eigenvalue of this. The spectrum just gets shifted. So this finishes the proof of proposition number 2. So proposition number three is actually the main one. So proposition number three says, g suppose you give me, give me an open set, a non-empty open set in M, I will denote by a script M the space of all smooth metrics, smooth Riemannian metrics G on M. If you give me a non-empty open set, then if I consider now the following space of metrics M sub U, this is going to be the space of all Riemannian smooth Riemannian metrics G on M such that there is a minimal surface for G that intersects U and it's non degenerate. So it's such that there exists a non degenerate minimal hypersurface uh, sigma in M s with sigma intersection U non-empty. So I look at all metrics such that one can find a non-degenerate minimal hypersurface intersecting my given open set U and the claim is that this is open as a subset of the space of metrics is open and dense in this infinity topology. Okay, so this is the this is the result. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so that's the general formula for of the Jacobi operator for a normal vector field. So my claim is that if you do this conformal deformation, the Jacobi operator is just a, a shift of the original one for every x that formula holds. Uh, no, no. So 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 the formula here is actually supposed to hold for every for every x and every i. It's just a calculation. You, know, you compute the Jacobi operator, you see that you, you have to compute the new second fundamental form, the, the, the new Ricci curvature. It's just a calculation, you see that there will be an extra factor there. You mean a Dagen value? Uh, no, because yeah, 
So the only way zero can be an eigenvalue of this is if 2n divided by i is an eigenvalue of the original thing. But 2n divided by i is like an infinite sequence, so that, that cannot happen. Yeah. So, so I'd like to prove proposition 3. Let me erase this too. If time permits, I will say a few words about the equidistribution. So the proof uh, is the following. So first the one proves openness. And this is the easy part. So if you give me a metric G in the set M sub U, then if this is the picture of U, uh, there is going to be some minimal surface sigma that intersects U and that is non-degenerate. So then by the implicit function theorem, one can say that if I, if I perturb the metric a little bit, so for every metric G prime that is sufficiently close to G in the infinity topology, there is going to be a unique minimal hypersurface sigma prime that is close to sigma in the C infinity topology. So if I perturb a little bit, I can perturb a little my minimal surface. And because it's a small perturbation, it still intersects the open set U. And non-degenerate is also an open property, so sigma prime is, uh, is going to be non-degenerate again. Okay, so openness, it's, it's easy. That's why we need the non-degeneracy assumption. I should say that what I mean by White's theory of bumpy metrics is that he proved that a generic metric is bumpy. Okay, so a generic metric has that property. So now, let me explain denseness. So you give me an arbitrary metric, G and M. So I take some neighborhood of G in the space of metrics. So this is a C infinity neighborhood of G and M. So maybe. So now this is supposed to be a neighborhood in the space of metrics. So G is somehow here. So first by Brian White, because generic implies dense, I know that there will be a metric in this neighborhood that is bumpy. So White proves that there exists some G prime in this neighborhood that is a bumpy metric. Okay, so G prime maybe is here. And then, one thing about bumpy metrics is that if I take the set of minimal hypersurfaces, you know, hypersurfaces sigma in G prime with both the volume and the index bounded, then this space is actually finite. Okay, so this follows because critical points are non-degenerate and we have this compactness theorem of Sharp that says that this space is actually uh, compact. So it's like a Morse function. A Morse function has only always finitely many critical points. Okay. So this space is finite. I should keep the viola here on the board. So, so the idea now is that, if I, well, if I consider the following set C, which is just the set of all linear combinations of this form, where n, n is some natural number, uh, the sigma i's form a disjoint collection of minimal surfaces in G prime, and the MIs are integers, because, you know, this set is finite, this set has to be countable. 
Okay, so there are only countably many real numbers that can be can be written in this form because G prime is bumpy. Okay, this is for G prime. Okay, so now I'd like to perturb my metric. The idea is that you would like to perturb your metric and see what what the viral law tells you. So. If I draw the picture, you know, you, gi you gave me an open set U in the manifold, so if this is U, my manifold M, then now I like to bump the volume up. So I take a function H, a smooth function from M to R, that is non negative, it's positive somewhere, and that has support contained in U. So you give me such a function, then I define the following deformation. So G prime of T is a conformal deformation. It's going to be 1 plus T times H times G, where T is now negative. So this is a smooth metric. Uh, it has the property that, of course, G prime of 0 is just G prime. Here's supposed to be G prime. G prime of 0 is G prime. And of course, because H vanishes outside U, I also have that G prime of T coincides with G prime outside U, outside some compact set contained in U. Okay, so this is my, my deformation. So I'm, I'm deforming my metric G prime. Of course, if I take T very small, so, so there is some T naught, so that if T is smaller than T naught, then the metric G prime of T will still be in the neighborhood nu. So here I'm starting from this metric here, and then I, I have some, some deformation. Maybe this is G prime of T naught. OK. So certainly, one thing we can, be, we can be sure is that the volume goes up. So the volume. volume of M with respect to G prime of T naught is strictly bigger than the volume of M with respect to G prime, right? Because H is a non-trivial function, so I'm bumping, I'm bumping the, the volume up. So the volume goes up. Now, if, we, if one looks at the vial law, well, the only way the volume can go up is if some K width goes up also. So one thing I can guarantee you is that there's going to be some k natural number such that omega k of m g prime of t naught is strictly bigger than omega k of m g prime. So now here's what you do. First of all, one can assume that I can assume that no embedded minimal hypersurface for g prime intersects U. Okay, for, so no, no minimal surface for G prime intersects U. Why? Well, because if there is one that intersects U, we are done. G prime was going to belong to, to M sub U. Okay, so, so we can assume that every minimal surface for G prime is sitting outside U. So then you consider the number omega K of M G prime of t, where t is between 0 and t naught. So there are only two possibilities for this number. Le remember that this number is always the area of a minimal surface for G prime of t. So either you create a new minimal surface. So either uh, this is achieved by a minimal surface that intersects u, right? And this is a new minimal surface. or the minimal surface does not intersect U, but if it does not intersect U, that minimal surface is also a minimal surface for G prime. And in that case, this number has to belong to, to C. Okay, so there are only two possibilities. Uh, either, either there is a minimal hypersurface that intersects U for some 
g prime of t. And in that case, by an arbitrarily small deformation, I can make it non-degenerate. And then you can make it non-degenerate. Or the minimal hypersurface is outside you, but then it's a minimal surface for G prime, in particular this number has to belong to C for every T. But then the contradiction follows easily because you know omega k of m g prime of t is a continuous function of t. So because this guy is a continuous function of t. So if the image belongs to a countable set for every t is because it is constant. That, of course, is a contradiction because I know that it goes up. Okay. Contradiction. So we must have that there is going to be a minimal hypersurface that intersects u for some g prime of t, right, for some guy here. And then, of course, by perturbing the metric, I can make it non-degenerate. So there is going to be a metric in the neighborhood such that there will be a minimal surface, non-degenerate one, that intersects u when we are done. We prove that it's dense. Okay, I just have some few minutes left, so I just would like to say what's the heuristics behind equidistribution. So, heuristics. Equi distribution. It's just that uh, if you give me an arbitrary number of functions, say maybe you give me capital N functions, these are smooth functions in my manifold, I can consider instead of doing a one parameter deformation of the metric G, I do an N parameter. So I define G hat of T1 Tn to be. 1 plus T1 F1 plus T capital N Fn times G. So I, I'm perturbing G in this N distinct uh, directions. So this is going to be a smooth metric for, for, for a small t. And then we know that by the viola law, uh, omega k divided by this power is almost the volume. So the point is that if I differentiate, say, with respect to Ti, the volume of m, say maybe time zero here, it's easy to, to do because the, I have an explicit formula. It's going to be n plus one divided by two times the integral of, in this case, it's going to be the fi function on m. So this is the derivative of the volume. But I can also differentiate uh, the k width of g hat with respect to ti. And the idea is that the, the k width is the area of a minimal surface. So you're differentiating the area of a minimal surface. So say this minimal surface is sigma k. So in that case, one can calculate this would be n divided by 2 times the integral of the function fi over sigma k, where sigma k is the minimal surface whose volume is omega k. So you see these two formulas, and then of course the heuristics is that this number should be almost the volume by the vial law. So if you differentiate both sides and you equate the bo both things, you're going to get a formula that suggests you that equidistribution should be true. Of course one has to work much harder. So we actually use some transversality uh, results 
the, the function omega k is only Lipschitz, so you cannot say that it's differentiable everywhere. It's differentiable only almost everywhere, so we need to, to use Smeus transversality theorem. You can see that uh, in the paper. So I should just finish by saying that I'd like to, to thank Paul and Alice for, for the support they have be given to me in Princeton for the past few years, so I take this opportunity to thank them. And I'll finish here. Thank you. So what's the relation with the Wimmer conjecture? So the relation is that in the Wimmer conjecture, we, we, we solved it by using five parameter sweep out. So it was the first time that we came up with mul multi parameter sweep outs. You would somehow correspond to k equal to five, yeah, exactly, yeah. Like the omega, it, it's very, as I said in the mini course, it's very hard to compute these numbers yeah. for specific manifolds, but we know, for instance, that Omega 5 of S3 is, the, is 2 pi squared, the area of the Clifford torus. And that's related to the Wimmer conjecture. Yeah, in that case, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, I mean, of course, I mean, this raises many questions. So possibly, one possible thing that could be true is that there is a sequence of individual surfaces uh, that gets equidistributed in, in the manifold. And certainly there's some analogies with eigenfunctions where in some cases one can prove that. Uh, I would is expect that it should be true. Yeah, there should be a sequence of embedded surfaces I, that individually they, they recover the, the volume of the manifold. Yeah. Yes. So which one? <laughs> So what's the question? Oh, no, no, no. It could be that this is true for all metrics, yes. Yeah. I mean, the problem with this thing is that it's very hard to classify minimal surfaces. Yeah. So you have a question? Yeah, oh, AM, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, that's also a good question because, uh, uh, I mean, one way of estimating these numbers, because this is about the area, but uh, one way you can estimate these numbers is by taking eigenfunctions and considering the nodal set, so the area of the nodal set, because the, the nodal sets of eigenfunctions, they are examples of k sweepouts. So you can estimate the area, you get an estimate for this number. Yeah. Whether the two constants, I mean, are the same, I mean, well, I don't know, yeah. But, uh, so of course, should say that we, d we don't know anything about these surfaces, right? So I mean, the topology, even the area, or the index, so very interesting to study this. Yeah. yeah, no, so even for, for S3 with the a, with a round metric, uh, we only know the first, the first widths uh, until omega 5 or maybe omega 9. But beyond that, we don't know. Uh, it should be interesting to to have a sequence of surfaces that at least are candidates for being the for for some specific models, maybe S3 or the maybe the torus or something like that. For eigenvalues, you can compute. You take a torus, you compute, but for minimal surfaces, uh, you cannot do that. <laughs>